This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. On today's program, we're going to continue to analyze current events, daily events, both in the USA and uh, across the world. And uh, one thing that, that is for certain, and that is the so-called experts, the pontificators, the blowhards, the ones that pretend to know everything and then try to force their arbitrary opinions and their miscalculations. They attempt to force those things upon us and, in effect, enslave us uh, with lies. Now, imagine this, to be enslaved by lies. When one thinks of being enslaved and, and looks in ancient history or recent history, Usually, when most people think of slavery, they either think of the <clears throat> what happened to the African Americans uh, who were brought over by, yes, sadly to say, uh, Christians in America to be slaves on their plantations, and they were treated horribly and cruelly, and uh, it by no means reflects the. It's, it's a direct opposition to the teachings of the Bible. And then one thinks of other uh, atrocities in ancient history. And usually, when you enslave a population, you, you do it by <clears throat> having a superior military force, troops, soldiers, whatever. Whatever the fighters are. The warrior classes, you enslave other people because you have, and this is something a lot of people in America are very, very naive about, and Christians are the most naive about, you are able to enslave others only because you have the power to do so. Now, it requires that you have a corrupt heart. It requires that you have first surrendered your heart to a heart of darkness. But after you've surrendered your heart to a heart of darkness, you you misuse the power and the intelligence that God has given you to capture, snare, and enslave others. And it's a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing because every single man and woman born no matter what race, no matter what ethnic group, is a child of God. Now, I'm not trying to be politically correct here. I'm not trying to, you know, uh, earn points uh, on the cultural landscape. I'm simply saying that if one reads the Bible as, as the foundation of your truth, your perspective, your perception, your, uh, your ability to make sense out of life, if you look at reality through a biblical worldview, that means through the lens of the Word of God, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, then and only then are you going to be able to perceive reality and this world accurately. If you reject a biblical worldview, this is extremely important, and you know, Despite the fact that this is of the utmost importance, you will almost never hear what I just said taught from a pulpit, uh, taught from a Christian seminary or a college or a Christian high school or Christians in general. I'm not saying that there aren't pastors and seminaries and churches that do teach the Bible. There are. There are. There are hopefully, thank, thankfully, there's a sizable percentage. But that sizable percentage is not the majority percentage. You see, if you don't, first you you save a person's soul. This is how it works. And you know this because you read the Bible. First, the first order of business is you've got to save somebody's soul. You've got to win them to Jesus Christ. Because unless a person has been won to Jesus Christ, which is just a, a different way of saying you have functioned as an evangelist and through conversation or by giving somebody a book or talking to them or, or whatever, in, in your communication with them, 
you've shared the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is simply this, that uh, you can have eternal life and live forever in heaven with God. Death is not the end of, of the story. When you die, if you're born again, you will immediately be in the presence of the Lord in your brand new glorified body. <clears throat> and you will be living in heaven eternally. You're an eternal creature. Now, if you choose to reject God's free offer of salvation in Jesus Christ, then when you die, you will not get a glorified body. You will stand before the great white throne of judgment, and you will be sentenced by the supreme judge of the universe for all eternity in a cosmic prison located in either the spiritual dimension or uh, another world. And that, that, that cosmic prison, let's call it the supermax, the eternal supermax, uh, is a place called hell. And you will live there, and you can't get out of there just like a prison, a good prison. You can't get out of there, and you will spend all eternity living in hell, okay? Now, for those of you that are not familiar with the Supermax prison, I talk about it in my book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind, because I was looking for an analogy, an earthly analogy, <clears throat> of, of a, a prison that's like designed by mankind so you can't escape. And uh, thankfully, probably most of you, if not all of you, who knows, uh, maybe most of you have never been in a, inside of a supermax prison. <clears throat> you need to thank God for that. A supermax prison is the latest and the greatest in terms of prison technology. It's impossible to escape. It has high-tech devices. And that's why uh, the, the old expression for these prisons that were designed so that nobody could escape from them. They used to be called maximum security facilities or maximum security prisons, where you put the really bad guys, the really dangerous guys. Now, they've taken it up a, a step. Now, the most uh, airtight prisons are called supermax prisons. And they are essentially impossible to escape from because they have so much technology and guards and uh, all kinds of things. So the supermax prison is a prison that's impossible to get out of. Now, God has designed a supermax prison. Now, now don't, don't blame that on God. God's original intention for mankind, God's original plan for mankind, was not for mankind to spend eternity in a supermax prison called hell. God's plan for mankind was for mankind, like Adam and Eve, to spend all of eternity in paradise. The Garden of Eden was paradise. Adam and Eve were not dying. They didn't get sick. Paradise was so wonderful, so beautiful, that we don't have vocabulary words to describe the wonders of paradise. But God, in his love for mankind, designed for mankind, men and women, to live in paradise, which is heaven on earth, for all eternity. That was the plan. It was never the plan of God. Okay? It was never the plan of God to send men and women into God's supermax prison for all eternity, also known as the lake of fire. And where you 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 live there, you can't get out. Once you once you go through the doors of God's supermax prison, you don't get out. <clears throat> you spend all eternity in what's called the lake of fire or hell. In ever and the Bible uses these words. It's very important not to gloss over God's description. You will spend all et if you reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. You will spend all eternity in God's super, supermax prison, and you, you, will, you will live in what the Bible calls eternal torment. Now, that's not because God is a super sadist. It's because to be separated from the, from the joys of heaven, 
to be separated from the love of God and the pure love of other people, to be separated from paradise, which is heaven, for all eternity, is is an emotionally and psychologically agonizing proposition. So you will spend all eternity in agony, eternal torment. Now, before you you try to muster up the words and and vocalize this, and you say, well, that, that means God's cruel. Or that means how can a loving God send people into eternal torment? How can a loving God send people to eternal torment? Well, we have to understand that heaven would not be heaven if people who were evil, corrupt, defiled, and serving Satan, if they were allowed into heaven, the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem, what would happen to heaven? Heaven would be corrupted. Heaven would be Heaven would become like hell on earth. Right now, heaven is so beautiful, we don't have words to describe it. But if we allowed these evil people who, who purposely have broken the laws of God, who have purposely rebelled from the laws of God, and who have intentionally chosen to serve Satan as their God, these people are so evil even if they outwardly appear to be nice, <clears throat> that if they were allowed into heaven, they would corrupt heaven. Heaven would no longer be a safe place. One of the things, and it almost sounds like a fairy tale, except let's remember, sometimes we need to have childlike faith. When God tells us the truth, just because it's wonderful does not mean it's a fairy tale. So, in the Bible, God promises that he will give every man and woman, everyone who gains entrance into heaven, becomes a joint heir with Jesus, which simply means that you uh, inherit the full kingdom of God. Now, remember, heaven is the kingdom of God. Okay? That's because. God is a king. Jesus Christ is the king of kings and lord of lords. Okay? Since Jesus is king, he is the ultimate ruler. And because Jesus is king, and God is the supreme being and a king, they own everything in the universe. The cattle, you know, endless amounts of cattle and gold and land and whatever you can imagine. The wealth of God is infinite. If you were to try to attempt to store up or collect all the wealth of God, you you could not, you gather up all the gold and the jewels and the precious metals and all of the things that are in this world and other worlds that God has created have an infinite value. Now, if you were to attempt to store them all in one place, you would probably need an infinite number of galaxies in which to contain the infinite wealth of God. Think about that. Now, think about this. Jesus Christ, even though he came to earth as as a suffering servant, Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. That means he is the owner and the ruler of all that is, including all the wealth of the universe. That is, that is what he owns as, as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So we need to, to focus in on the fact that God is powerful, his wealth is infinite, his wisdom is infinite, his love is infinite, and God owns an infinite amount of wealth. Now, whoever chooses to put their faith in God's free offer of salvation, whoever chooses to put their faith in God's free offer of salvation, comes to Jesus Christ and, first of all, asks to be forgiven of their sins, past, present, and future. 
and ask to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ from all of their sins, which means Jesus pays the price, the penalty for every sin in your life, past, present, and future. When you put your faith in that and receive that as a free gift, then you are cleansed of all sin. And then when you put your faith in God's free offer of salvation in Christ Jesus, not only are all your sins forgiven, but then you invite Christ into your life and you're born again. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, comes inside you and you are born again. When you are born again, you are an authenticated new creature in Christ Jesus, which simply means when you're born again, you go through an instantaneous transformation where you become a brand new man or a brand new woman in Christ Jesus. The old sinful man or woman is corrupt. It's under the curse. It's under the fall. That's why every man and woman alive eventually dies. Because the death force which entered the human race, because Adam and Eve chose to disobey God in the Garden of Eden, and they rejected the commands of the Word of God and ate from the tree, or ate from the fruit of the tree in the middle of, of the Garden of Eden. When that happens, the death force came into Adam and Eve and the human race, and Adam and Eve, in their disobedience, activated the law of sin and death. So they began to degrade and die. Then the fall of man, which is what that disobedience was, caused all men and women to carry the death force in them. That's why all of us are dying. Even as we speak now, we don't like to think about it, but even as we speak now, we're dying. And we get sick. And then there's sin and crime and violence and cruelty in the earth because of the sin force that came into the earth through Adam's disobedience. But God devised a plan to rescue men and women, uh, Adam and Eve and mankind. God devised a plan to rescue men and women from the law of sin and death and provided a way. That's why Jesus Christ said, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. They provided a way, God provided a way for men and women to be saved. That's why we need salvation. The people in this world, in Hollywood or whatever, in the political realm or whatever, they strut around like pretentious, uh, artificially intelligent peacocks strutting their feathers as if they're immortal. But they're fools. They're not immortal. They're fools. Because they have chosen to reject the greatest gift, which has the greatest value in all, in all the universe. And that is the gift of forgiveness of sin in Christ Jesus and the free gift of salvation. But people say, well, why do I need to be saved? And, and they blow it off, and, and they make light of it. Why do I need to be saved? I'll tell you why you need to be saved. I mean, it should be obvious to you why you need to be saved. First of all, numero uno, and I'm not talking about the pizza. Numero uno. Right now, at this moment, you are dying, your body is degrading. So you have, you know, whether you live to be 110, 125, if that, that's a speck of dust. In, in light of eternity. So, you're dying, you're getting sickness, disease, you live in an imperfect world, which is getting more imperfect every day. But when you accept God's free offer of salvation, or free gift of salvation in Christ Jesus, and all your sins are forgiven, and then you become born again, then you receive by faith not only the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, But because when you're born again, you become a brand new woman or man in Christ Jesus. You become a new creature in Christ Jesus. But now, this is where it gets heavier and cosmic and, like, super interesting. 
And by super interesting, I mean you launch out into a cosmic trip of, of eternal ecstasy, wonder, delight, and excitement. Some Christians are afraid of actually saying, there's so many Christians that I meet that they're reluctant. They're, they tiptoe around the mind-blowing wonder of what it means to be saved. It's like they were afraid to describe everything that goes with the package of salvation. Salvation is not some, you know, thing you can toss away. Salvation is you're delivered from all your problems, sins, bondage, diseases, emotional problems, physical world problems, dying, uh, you know, family relationship problems, the problems of the coronavirus and all the rest of this nonsense. All of this crazy, loony tune, it's like, it's like you and I live in an insane asylum called planet Earth. Well, that, God didn't design that for us. So when we're born again and filled with the Spirit of God, the promises of God become activated in our inner man or inner woman. That should produce when you meditate upon God's Word. And then when you understand that when you're saved and born again and your sins are forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ, that's why Jesus is the Savior. But that's no small word. And Jesus Christ gives us the free gift of salvation if we'll receive it by faith. Well, what that does is that you become a brand new person in Christ Jesus. You're born again. When you're born again, you then become a child or daughter in the kingdom of God. Okay? Not just a child or daughter of God, but you come you become a child or daughter in the kingdom of God. So the place where God lives and all of God's people live for all eternity is called heaven. And that contains many things, such as the new heaven and new earth and the new Jerusalem. When you're saved, you uh, become a joint heir with Jesus Christ. What does that mean? To become a joint heir with Jesus Christ. It means that you are guaranteed to share in the kingdom inheritance of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. That means that, yes, Jesus, who is Lord, he, he receives all things. All things. He owns all things. An infinite wealth. No poverty, no lack. God owns all things. But when you become a born-again child of God, you then become a joint heir with Jesus. It's as if if, if, if you went to a lawyer, and uh, let's say somebody in your family or somebody you know put you in their will. Uh, using lawyers. So they create a document, a legal document called a will. And in the will, uh, if your name is written in the will, uh, the person who is now dead has, has left you or transferred to you uh, uh, a certain amount of items that contain value or monetary value or wealth. It could be you know, I, I, I leave you my, my old running shoes when I used to be a track star uh, in college. Well, a pair of smelly uh, running shoes is, you know, unless the person was really famous. It's just, I don't know. I don't think, you'd, you know, that's not really something in inheritance that, in most cases, that you would really value, unless there was some special emotional meaning to it. So. In a will, a person lists all the people who are going to receive uh, things, monetary things, things hopefully of value, hopefully not of junk, 
but you're going to receive all kinds of things that the person who is now dead that has left behind. And usually to the closest members of the family, uh, the person who's dead, like to his children, okay, uh, or his grandchildren, or whatever, and sometimes it varies. The things of most value are often given to them. Not all the time, but, but a great deal of the time. So the lawyer officiates, he writes a will, and upon the death of the person who dies, the, the assets in that person's estate, assuming they legally created an estate, an estate is a legal umbrella uh, which contains all the things of value and worth that this individual who's now dead owned. So an estate, in a sense, is like a kingdom. Now, for most people, your estate is not the same level as the, the value of a king. It's, it's much, much more modest. But in an estate, people leave uh, monetary wealth, jewelry, real estate, uh, their homes, apartments, condos, uh, uh, cars, land, all kinds of things. Their boat, which could either be a wonderful yacht or it could be, you know, a very inexpensive uh, rowboat with a with a motor on it. I mean, you know, the, the wills <laughs> wills can contain things of great value, and and you know, people leave their clothes and stuff, and people a lot of people throw it out because they never never want to begin with. But the point is that in the estate, and you don't have to be a wealthy person to have an estate, because an estate is simply a legal structure to contain a person's assets. And upon the death of that person, those assets contained in the state, the state are distributed, are given to different people or individuals, usually or most often within the family. And so the wealth of, of the deceased person is distributed. Now, that is like a mini, mini version of a kingdom, unless, you know, your estate is the Rothschild estate or the Rockefeller estate or the Bill Gates estate. And then it's really, a, it's a kingdom. So <clears throat> when you become a joint heir with Jesus, that means that, Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He owns all the wealth in the universe. His wealth is infinite. But when you become a born again son or daughter of God, you then automatically, according to the law of God, and that's the highest law in the universe, according to the law of God, automatically, Jesus, out of his love for you, chooses to make you. And heir along with him. Remember, he's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So Jesus Christ chooses to make you a joint heir with him. And so you you receive part of the inheritance that Jesus Christ receives. This is no small thing. Because when you become a joint heir with Jesus, then you have now entered. The, the highest level royal family that can, can ever exist, and that is the royal family of God. And you, you enter in supernaturally through the blood of Jesus. You enter in uh, into a covenant. That's that's an agreement, a contract, a legally bind, a binding agreement. So God voluntarily he doesn't have to do this. God voluntarily cuts you in on uh, a significant part of his wealth or his estate. Now, when we're talking about Jesus, I mean, you think of the wealth of uh, uh, you know, the Queen of England and her family. Well, I, I discussed the wealth of the wealthiest families in the world, including the Queen of England. 
and the Rothschild family and the Rockefeller families and, and, and many others. There are like 12, approximately 12 families control all the wealth of the world. And I explain this and outline this in my books, The Day the Dollar Died and uh, A Prophecy of the Future of America, the first book, and then A Prophecy of the Future of America, Volume 2. And the reason I explain it is because most Christians have never received any Bible teaching that deals with the concept of wealth and multiplying wealth and ownership from a biblically sound uh, approach. So, so when you become a joint heir with Jesus, and the minute you're born again, you're a joint heir with Jesus. That means you you share uh, in in His inheritance, and His inheritance is infinite. Now, as a joint heir with Jesus, which you become when you're born again, that means. As an heir, you receive everything that that Christ has voluntarily given you as King of Kings. It it consists of not only material wealth, and it consists not only of uh, uh, homes and and things of material value, but Jesus' inheritance also includes things of great spiritual wealth, and the stuff of great spiritual wealth has uh, an infinite value. Uh, it, it, it contains infinite value. So an example is when you're born again, as a joint heir with Jesus Christ, one of the first things that you receive in your inheritance is you receive the gift from Jesus Christ of eternal life. You receive the gift of living in a perfect, brand new, glorified body. Okay, you receive the gift of uh, living in heaven with Jesus in your brand new glorified body for all of eternity, and you will enjoy heaven, which will consist of the new earth, a brand new earth that will be par- paradise on steroids. So you'll live in the brand new earth, uh, the brand new heaven, and the new Jerusalem. Because this present earth, this present heaven, has been so defiled and corrupted and polluted that it is not only a toxic place to live, because man has horribly polluted and and defiled uh, planet earth, but man has also polluted and defiled the heavens. Just look at the chemtrails and the toxins in the air. So, So you will live in heaven, which is paradise on earth in a brand new glorified body. And then, if you bother to... so, And then you get all these spiritual gifts that have infinite value, because you see, not only do you get salvation, you get deliverance, but if you read the Bible carefully, you get all kinds of supernatural gifts, talents, abilities, and blessings. That's all just a, a part of your inheritance in Christ Jesus. So you see, you, you need to allow the Holy Spirit to, to enlighten and amplify your mind. If you walk around like, like a religious robot, Isaac Asimov, the great science fiction writer, wrote a sci-fi novel called I, Robot. Many of you didn't read the book, but you saw the sci-fi movie, I, Robot, with Will Smith. And you see that in this futuristic world, the rulers, the elite of of planet Earth, uh, have created uh, an army of upgraded robots that use the highest level of artificial intelligence and, they're tr- and these robots are transhumanist robots. And so, because they utilized artificial intelligence, these robots that were created by a human corporation soon begin to excel and evolve 
way beyond men and women in their intelligence, in their ability, and I robot is a warning to the human race that if you create artificially intelligent robots, they are soon going to take over planet Earth, and they will be uh, the rulers of planet Earth, and mankind will be the slaves. And and we are facing that dilemma now, as artificial intelligence is controlling and ruling over more and more areas of our lives without our recognition of it. So, God, um, we become joint heirs with Jesus, and this is where we need a revelation of the Holy Spirit. We are not heirs to some human will. You know, the wealthy people that Forbes magazine lists who are super billionaires, that, that's, that's a very shallow and dishonest uh, journalistic reporting of who's the wealthiest people in the world. In my book, uh, A Prophecy of the Future of America, Volume 2, I, I quote uh, Forbes magazine where I have selected some of the wealthiest and most well-known people in the world. And it's people like Bill Gates, and it's people like Jeff Bezos of Amazon, and it's people like uh, Jeff Zuckerberg of uh, Facebook, and uh, what is it, Dorsey of uh, uh, Twitter, you know, the robber bar- barons of high tech. And then there are families. Uh, uh, but see, Forbes magazine doesn't list the families because the families are far wealthier wealthier than the super billionaires. All they do is list the super billionaires. But the super billionaires don't have anywhere near the wealth that the Rockefeller family, the Rothschild family, and many of these elite bloodline families contain. Because these families have been around with their wealth for hundreds of years or more. And they don't have it. They know how to hide their money. So a reporter can't just figure out how much they're worth. Not only do the wealthiest people in the world know how to hide their money, they distribute their wealth among family members, or they park their wealth in in, in corporations and foundations, which doesn't always contain their name. So it's, so, so you, it's not easy to track just how wealthy these people are. But to summarize it, and I go into it in my book, uh, Prophecy of the Future of America, to summarize it, these families are not just billionaires like Jeff Bezos and Gates are. Okay. Uh, Gates not only became the owner and controller of Microsoft, which earned him billions, but Gates is also the heir or recipient <clears throat> to the for, to the vast fortune of uh, uh, William Buffett, the mega investor. So, so um, Gates is not only the recipient of his own wealth through Microsoft, but he's an heir to the Buffett fortune. And the Buffett fortune is worth billions and billions and billions. But there are other super wealthy people that belong to the elite families that hide their money. And these people are never listed in Forbes magazine or other magazines. And I explain the secret reason why they don't want you to know how wealthy they are. And I'm talking about like Rockefeller, the Rockefeller family, the uh, Rockefeller family, I'm having a mental blank here. Uh, Carnegie family, the, the international banking families that controlled and created the Federal Reserve, which which I expose the secret of the Federal Reserve in my book, uh, The Day the Dollar Died. Uh, and uh, they control the vast wealth of uh, the the. the bloodline families of Europe, and these people are super trillionaires or or beyond. But you'll never read about 
the vast total or amount of their wealth in the media, it's always it's always uh, concealed. So uh, Rothschild family, one of the wealthiest families on planet Earth, they have their money spread out and hidden all over the place. And they're not worth just millions. They're worth trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. So I explain all this in, in these books. And it's, the reason I explain it is because the mass media, which is owned by the wealthiest people in the world, they don't want you to know just how wealthy Rothschild and the Rockefellers and the others are. These guys are super trillionaires. And the reason they don't want people to know is that these guys are so wealthy that they could write out a check, a personal check, and erase the national debt of the United States or just about any nation on planet Earth. In fact, if the truth was really revealed, the the super wealth of the trillionaires like the Rothschilds, etc., they could end world poverty. They could end world hunger. Uh, they could solve very quickly many of the problems uh, that we're facing on planet Earth. But you see, they don't want anyone to know that they have the monetary power to do that, because then there would be an uprising among the peoples of planet Earth, and the common peoples, if they found some way to challenge the rule of the super-rich, they would expect the super-rich to, to, to write out checks and solve many of our problems. Because many of our... See, it's not that there's not enough money to, to solve some of our problems. The major problem is that there's, there's nobody who has the will to use their vast amount of money to solve any of these problems. So instead, these super wealthy people go around buying up and owning all of the mainstream media and constantly lying to the people that the only way we can solve poverty, <clears throat> lack of education, drugs, war, murder, uh, the, the problems in the inner cities, etc., pollution, climate change, if you will, or whatever. The only way we can solve these problems, according to the traditional viewpoint, which the super wealthy artificially created through mass mind control and brainwashing, so people believe the only solution is for all the middle class <clears throat> and all the working middle class, and all the working class, if the working class and the working middle class will pay far more of their money in taxes, and if the working class and the working middle class, uh, if, if they are forced to earn and keep less money, then all those monies of the working class and the and medical med, uh, Middle class, all the all the monies they have can be uh, put together in one big, <clears throat> you know, amount. And if you add it all up, <clears throat> you could could make a significant improvement on on world hunger, world poverty, disease, the coronavirus, and everything else. And so the emphasis is always placed on the working class and the middle class, the blame, the guilt, the shaming, the attacks uh, are always targeted towards the hard-working, patriotic, <clears throat> honest, tax-paying, working class and uh, middle class, working class. They're the bad guys. You know, people who have a house in the suburbs are the bad guys. People who have a, a nice condo are the bad guys. People who have a bicycle are the bad guys if you're in Africa. And so the mass media, the mainstream media, is a psychological propaganda tool and brainwashing tool that is used 
<clears throat> to control the thoughts and actions of the masses of people in America and across the world. And in that mind control bubble that Aldous Huxley called the scientific dictatorship, people are brainwashed into believing that they should be, feel guilty and they should be shamed because they're the ones. It's amazing how you can socially engineer people to. This is what is mind blowing to me. By using scientific techniques of mind control, propaganda, persuasion, social engineering, brainwashing, you can create a ruling class like uh, uh, Bertrand Russell, the intellectual, global elite, and an author of Brave New World, which advocated a scientific dictatorship in which the elite control the masses through scientific mind control. Brzezinski, the former Secretary of State for uh, Obama, uh, he also advocated a technocratic dictatorship which would use scientific mind control technology and mass surveillance to enslave the masses and brainwash the masses in a plan much like Huxley's. And so did H.G. Wells, one of the planners of the New World Order and of the scientific dictatorship. So here, here's the thing. This is the, there's an evil plot. Ray Bradbury, the science fiction author, wrote a book called Something Wicked Comes This Way. Well, that's what's happening in the world today and in the United States. Bradbury's title, Something Wicked Comes This Way, is very applicable. Because the name of the game, when you're putting people under mass mind control and brainwashing, is to get them to take false ownership, false blame for poverty, for hunger, and for everything else. And I, I wanted to explain this uh, in, in my book, uh, Prophecy of the Future of America, Volume 2. And you can get, at, at a bundle discount, you can get A Prophecy of the Future of America, Volume 1, A Prophecy of the Future of America, Volume 2, At the Day the Dollar Died, and other super important books that will help you understand what's going on right now. Um, if, you, if you read these books and you can get, you can save money and get a financial discount. Uh, if you go to paulmcguire.us right now, that's paulmcguire.us right now, and buy uh, the book bundle discounts. So you, so by getting uh, a, a quantity of books, or two books, or four books, or whatever, you can save money, and then you can pass it around to your friends. But you got to go to paulmcguire.us now. While that book bundle special is still Available now. What I wanted to tell people in in the book, uh, A Prophecy of the Future of America, Volume One and Volume Two, I talk about King Solomon, and again, I go into detail. But the important thing about King Solomon is to understand he was the wealthiest man who ever lived, and he was the wisest man who ever lived. So, if you compare King Solomon today, you could put them all together. Uh, Rockefeller, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos. Uh, you could put all these billionaires and trillionaires together, and all of their wealth combined, they still would not be as wealthy as the wealthiest man who ever lived, and that was King Solomon. And King Solomon was also the wisest man that ever lived. Now, the secret to King Solomon's wealth is unlike many of these billionaires and trillionaires who were secretly occultists and Satanists, King Solomon, at least in the beginning of his career, he was a child of God. He was a worshiper, and, and he served the biblical God. And it was the biblical God who supernaturally gave Solomon the power to make wealth. And it was the biblical God who supernaturally gave Solomon supernatural wisdom 
that made him the wisest man who, who ever lived. And so uh, kings of other empires, uh, Cleopatra, uh, the wealthiest, most powerful people in the world would travel from distant lands to, to be able to meet with King Solomon and get his wisdom. And they would see his wealth. It was mind-blowing. He had a global empire. And uh, there's nobody like him today. Now, the world system, the, the scientific dictatorship, the globalist elite. Who are the globalist elite? Well, you need to know that. If, if you're walking around in life saying the globalist elite, which is a term I coined 20 years ago. Now it's very popular. But five years ago, nobody was using the term globalist elite. It was never used. If I was to use the term globalist elite on Fox News even three years ago or two years ago, they probably would have bleeped it out. But I publicized that word along with the Luciferian elite, the globalist elite, through my books and appearances on Fox and other news networks. I, I, put, I made the word globalist elite uh, a word that now is heard all over the world and used by people in the media all the time. But three years ago, they wouldn't have touched it with a 10-foot pole. They would have said, oh, he's a conspiracy theorist. In fact, on some of these programs, I would have been called a conspiracy theorist for daring to come up with the words globalist elite and, and other phrases and terms and words that I've popularized. But they were wrong, and they're still wrong, because they don't even understand truly what the term globalist elite means. They just use it. They use the word shadow government. All these people on Fox and other channels use the term shadow government. But they have no, not a single one of them can explain to you what the shadow government is and, and who is in the shadow government. Well, I explain the truth of the shadow government and who is in the shadow government in detail in my books. Get them in a book bundle. I, I go into detail about how the shadow government was formed, how it's operating today, how it came into being, stuff you will never hear on Newsmax or Fox or any Christian program. You won't hear it because people don't read and study. I've, I've been studying this for four years. Actually, longer than that, because my research began before I was 15 years old. And in terms of recent history, um, when we wrote uh, two, two best-selling books, uh, I wrote with Troy Anderson, a Pulitzer Prize-nominated investigative journalist. And the Lord brought us together. He uh, supernaturally... He was attending a Bible prophecy conference that was being hosted at Jack Hibbs Church, Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills. And, and just about every famous Bible prophecy teacher was speaking there, or at least the top Bible prophecy teachers were speaking at the conference. Names that you would name, would, would know. And I, by God's grace, I mysteriously ran into Troy, who wanted to interview. We, we became friends, and then we wrote our first book, The Babylon Code, which goes back to ancient Babylon and explains the, the source of the shadow government and the globalist elite. And that became uh, one of the best-selling prophecy books in the world. And then, it was about a year later, we wrote uh, another best-selling prophecy book called Trumpocalypse. And Trumpocalypse, Troy doesn't run around calling himself a prophet. I don't run around calling myself a prophet. But uh, in Trumpocalypse, we predicted uh, everything that's happening now in detail. And we explained when that was really, when we, when we wrote Trumpocalypse, Nobody knew 
who the shadow government was, the, the, the globalist elite. Those terms were not popular terms. Our book uh, broke the ice uh, in the mass media, among Christians, because our book was, you know, there were other books that dealt with it, but our book was the only book that dealt with it at its root level. So you can't understand who the shadow government is. You can't understand who the globalist elite are. You can't understand that unless you're willing to do the deep dive. And that, if you're a Christian, you're looking for truth, you're not going to get it unless you're willing to do the deep dive. The same with the secular researcher. So in our book, Trumpocalypse, we explain uh, many of the uh, uh, information uh, that I had done in my earlier books provided the foundation for the truth we expose in both the Babylon Code and uh, Trumpocalypse. But then Troy and I did a deeper dive, and unlike most books, which really don't answer the question, we explain to you, the reader, who the shadow government is, who the globalist elite are. And other people can't explain it because they don't know. I listen to these, you know, all these so-called experts on Fox News and stuff. They don't have a clue. They have no idea whatsoever who the shadow government is, or the globalist elite. They have no clue. And, and, and a great deal of them still think it's a conspiracy theory. Well, you have some of the most intelligent men in the world right now. People we quoted in interviews in our book, Trumpocalypse, uh, uh, Noam, Chops, Noam Chomsky, the brilliant leftist professor who thoroughly understands, for the most part, the shadow government, the deep state, uh, and stuff like that. We have some world-renowned intellectuals and experts, many of them who are secular or atheistic or radical leftists, but they're intelligent men, and they, they understand, they've taken the time to do their homework, and they understand history, and so they can explain to at least an adequate level, who the shadow government is, the globalist, the lead, and the deep state. But you see, this is the point I'm trying to make. You cannot ultimately gain the full understanding of exactly who the deep state is, the, the uh, shadow government, um, and, and things of that nature. You can't truly Connect all the dots. I'm very serious about this. When you're talking to your friends and stuff, and pastors, you cannot truly understand who and what the deep state, the shadow government, the globalist elite truly is unless you're willing to reject your bias and prejudice against the truth of the Bible in the Old Testament and the New Testament, because it's only by gaining a thorough knowledge, which comes from study and self-educating yourself, it's only through gaining a thorough and deep knowledge from the Word of God, you've got to go back to the book of Genesis, you've got to go back to ancient Babylon at the time of the Tower of Babel, you have to go back to uh, uh, ancient Egypt, the time of the Pharaoh and and Moses, uh, and what I have termed uh, the Pharaoh God King system. You have to understand that stuff, and you can, and then ultimately you cannot un, you can't connect the dots and really understand the deep state, the shadow government, the globalist elite, the Luciferian elite. You can't really understand that unless you're willing to give up your bias again, and that means you need to reject the falsehood of a philosophical system you've built for yourself, which is built upon myths, lies, and non-truths. Unless you're willing to reject uh, the non-truths that you're embracing as truth, 
you will always be on the outside looking in and trying to figure out who really runs the world. And only the Bible, only the Bible, among all of the spiritual books in, in the history of mankind, only the Bi- Bible connects the dots between the physical material world, mankind's history in terms of what happened in physical reality, only the Bible connects those dots with what occurred as what we could call a prime mover, which means forces that were energized from the invisible realm or spiritual world. And most people had such intellectual prejudice that they used to just reject it with almost an intellectual violence. Now, they're forced to confront uh, the the research that that we've done um, and that I've done in my books for, for 35 years. They're forced to come to terms with it because secular science, humanistic science itself, now admits that that on a scientific basis, uh, there are more dimensions than just the physical dimensions that we can perceive with our senses. That the universe or reality is composed of at least a minimum of 12 to 13 different dimensions. Okay? And that this is even further reinforced by discoveries and research in the fields of what are called what is called quantum physics and modern string theory quantum physics is the branch of physics which has proved that there are at least 12 to 13 dimensions and that means we have dimensions beyond time and space and we have dimensions that are are in the invisible world and dimensions which are in the unseen realm. And uh, this means, at a minimum, there are all kinds of dimensions that interface, impact, and control our everyday physical reality. But these dimensions are dimensions that cannot be perceived with our physical senses, like our hearing and our sight. But they exist, nevertheless. And the Bible, when you read the Bible as scientific history, not as mythology, then you understand that God is continually, from Genesis to Revelation, God is continually trying to raise the level of the intelligence and knowledge of his people. Why would God do that? Because God is love and God created us to be joint heirs with Jesus. That means you and I are destined to be kings and queens in God's eternal kingdom for all eternity. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to be God. Only God is God. Only Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But under the lordship of Christ, under the authority of Jesus Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords, you and I, in the plan of God, as joint heirs with Jesus, are allowed to be, to rule with Jesus. We're we're allowed to rule and reign with Jesus Christ as kings and queens. But not, but but that doesn't mean we're God. We're still, we're still under the lordship of Christ because he is king of kings and lord of lords. We're just kings and queens on a slightly lower level, but it is within the kingdom of God. See, this is how heavy it is. The core of our identity has changed. Okay? Now, here's where truth explodes in your consciousness. So, for for example, right now, the truth of God's word is being presented to you. You're hearing it on the Paul McGuire Report on Paul McGuire. Okay? You're, you're being exposed to higher level truth, or what Dr. Francis Schaeffer called true truth or final reality. Okay, if this is a little rough for you, see, this is the difference between gaining real knowledge, real education, which produces power, truth, freedom. Knowledge is power. When you dumb down the kids through the mind control factories, uh, that we we 
dare to call, you know, education. But the, their brains of adults and kids are stupefied. Their intelligence is degraded so they can be compliant slaves in a scientific dictatorship. They don't want the common man and woman to have the keys to power. Now, tragically, because God's people have rejected his word, the Jews rejected his word constantly in the Old Testament, and they became slaves. They went into captivity because of it. In the New Testament, and in the time we live in, God's people today also reject much of the truth of God's word and don't even bother to study God's word. For example, the the area of Bible prophecy is refused. 87% of evangelical born-again churches in America have issued orders forbidding the teaching of Bible prophecy not allowing the book of Revelation to be taught, and they refuse to teach Bible prophecy beginning in, in, in Genesis and, and going all the way through the book of Revelation. Even though the book of Revelation at the beginning and the, in the end is the only book in the Bible which promises a supernatural blessing to the person who will faithfully read and teach uh, accurately the book of Revelation. So, if you want a guaranteed blessing, anytime you want it, you want like a heavy-duty supernatural blessing, then set apart some time and read uh, the book of Revelation. It doesn't take long. You can read it in one setting or two or three settings. You read the book of Revelation faithfully from Genesis to Revelation. You might even take notes and questions for yourself. And God promises you that if you faithfully will read the book of Revelation in its entirety, you're going to receive a supernatural blessing. There is no other book in the Bible where God gives such a promise. That's God's way of underlining how important it is for his people to read and study faithfully the book of Revelation. Yet, we have 87% of born-again evangelical churches, ministers, pastors, ministries, Christian media, uh, Christian seminaries and colleges, etc., that, and, and the pastors from the pulpit, and, and the Bible study uh, leaders, etc., who literally, in a flagrant violation of the Word of God, they refuse to teach the book of Revelation, they refuse to teach it accurately, and then they disobey God by changing the book of Revelation to fit their own personal private meaning. Now, what's the problem with this? Number one is, the book of Revelation is the only book in the Bible where God puts things in at the very beginning and the very end of the book of Revelation because he wants to give a big heads up to his people. Number one, God pro- it's the only book in the Bible where God promises a supernatural blessing upon the person who will faithfully read or teach the book of Revelation. If you do that, you are guaranteed a supernatural blessing from God. Number two, it's the only book in the Bible where if you fail to read the book of Revelation, uh, uh, and teach the book of Revelation faithfully, or you twist its meaning, you are, God tells you right at the beginning, you're going to be, you will be cursed. So the book of Revelation gives you a choice to be supernaturally blessed or supernaturally cursed. That's right in in the very beginning of the book of Revelation. At the end of the book of Revelation, once again, this is not the case with any other chapter in the Bible, At the end of the book of Revelation, God warns his people of both the blessing and the curse that will come upon them that is contingent or based upon their faithfulness in dealing with the book of Revelation. So, once again, God promises a supernatural blessing upon the leader, the individual Christian, the pastor, the ministry, the church. 
you're granted a supernatural blessing if you are faithful to teach and preach and study the book of Revelation uh, and rightly divide the word of God. In other words, you're not injecting your own interpretation. You're not erasing parts of it because you're personally uncomfortable with it. You are rightly dividing the word of God because it's holy. And because you are faithful to teach the book of Revelation exactly how God wrote it and exactly how God expects it to be teached, a blessing will come upon you and your people and your and your church. Okay, this is powerful. Okay, but then, uh, unlike any other book in the Bible, you have the opportunity for that blessing. But if you choose to to uh, cut and paste and change the meaning of the book of Revelation because you're personally uncomfortable with it. Let's say it makes you uncomfortable to teach people about the reality of hell. So the Bible says there is a hell, whether you like it or not. And so if you personally decide on your own personal finite mind that you're going to censor what Revelation says about hell and judgment and the second coming and Armageddon, and what happens to people who uh, accept the mark of the beast? They go into the lake of fire for all eternity. Because you are upset by the heaviness of God's word, and you make the arbitrary decision to censor God's word, to erase God's word, and to deliberately and methodically refuse to teach all of God's word regarding the book of Revelation, God says you will be under a curse. Not only will you not receive a blessing, you'll be under a curse. And the curse is so intense and so heavy that God says to the Christian leaders and to Christians uh, that if you fail to preach and teach uh, the book of Revelation accurately, um, then, and you, because you're uncomfortable, with, with subjects in the book of Revelation. So you just decide arbitrarily, based on your own mind, that you're going to censor out all the passages that you find difficult. God warns you, and God warns any ministry, God warns any church, that if you choose to do that, if you choose to censor or change the literal meaning of the book of Revelation, God promises to pour out a curse upon you. And that curse may very well include that your name will be stamped out or your name will actually be removed from the book of life in the book of Revelation. What is the book of life in the book of Revelation? To every person who God allows to go into heaven, uh, your name will be written in the book of life. So if your name is written in the book of life, then you're guaranteed entrance into heaven, and you'll spend all eternity living in heaven with Jesus Christ and everybody else who's saved. But if you choose to censor or erase or not teach the book of Revelation or change the book of Revelation, you could very easily find that your name has been erased by God, just like you erased God's word because you didn't like it, you may very well find that God has decided to erase your name from the book of life, and your name has been blotted out or removed from the book of life. What does that mean? It means that because you disobeyed God, and you decided to change or erase or censor the book of Revelation, that in judgment against what you did, despite his warning, your name is blotted out from the book of life, your name is removed from the book of life, and as such, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven for all eternity. You're locked out. Now, I don't care how you want to process that. If you're sane, and I believe you are, and you're rational, and you really believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, you, you, your feet should tremble. You should, you should tremble and, and shake. 
not like a full blown guy. Just you should tremble and shake. Because in America, and as other places in the world, but America is like a nation of, of spoiled brats. And we, we bring that spoiled brat mentality uh, into our perspective of who God is. And we think that God's just our chummy chum chum, our, 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 you know, our bro, our, our best buddy. No, he can be our friend within the context that he's our Lord first. And so when God tells us to do something, we need to change gears in our heart and mind, and we need to jump on it. If we say that Jesus Christ is Lord, that means we don't go on our merry way and just ignore what he commands us. If God is taking the time to warn us that our name could be blotted out from the book of life or removed from the book of life, which means we would not enter heaven, and and the reason would be God did that because we censored the teaching of the book of Revelation. We erased the teaching of the book of Revelation, or we changed the teaching of the book of Revelation. That's a heavy-duty sin in the eyes of God. You know why? Because if you're willing to change and censor the book of Revelation in regards to heaven, hell, and all the other tough subjects, How can you say you really love people? Because by depriving people the truth of God's word regarding the book of Revelation, you're opening the door. You're very, in a very real sense, you have opened the door of danger and you've opened the door of possibility that potentially large numbers of people will not be born again, will not enter heaven. They will not live with Jesus Christ in heaven for all eternity, eternity. But instead, they will be cast into the lake of fire and experience eternal torment. And they won't be able to get out. That, that's a horror. F- if you're spiritually alive and you can live with yourself, I, I don't know what to tell you. I shake. I'm serious. I mean, it's not a physical shaking where I... You know, like having a spasm while I'm sitting here. But my inner man trembles. It trembles. And I'll tell you why it trembles. Because I fear God. Not in some neurotic, pathological sense. Not in the sense of somebody who had an earthly father that was abusive, that molested them, that was sadistic. I don't fear God on the basis that God is some kind of serial killer, psychopath, child abuser, you know, a raging psychotic. That's not why I fear God. Because I know first and foremost God is love. But I also know that God's law is true. And because law, God's law is true, it has to come to pass exactly as he said it does. So the fear of the Lord I have is not a neurotic, psychotic, reactionary fear, the fear of the Lord I have is a, is, is, could be translated as an exceedingly healthy respect for just what it means for Jesus Christ to be King of kings and Lord of lords. And so I'm sober about that. And when you mess with God's word and censor it, you are, you are opening the door to the possibility that people are not going to take God's word seriously. Which means they're see if you're if you're censoring Revelation, if you're not teaching the book of Revelation and teaching the Word of God, the passages on Revelation and Bible prophecy, and you're a pastor or a Bible study leader or an ordinary Christian or a Christian college, Christian seminary, or Christian ministry, and and because you want the approval of man, you're censoring the book of Revelation. You're not teaching it. This is what, this is the sin you're potentially committing. People who don't know the Word of God for themselves are looking to you uh, as an authority figure, and they're expecting that you have the truthful and right answers. And and when you teach the Bible faithfully, they're going to have a very healthy respect for the reality of heaven and the reality of hell. And the fact that if you don't repent of your sins and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, 
you're going to spend all eternity in, de- in hell, and you will be banned from heaven. In addition, if you refuse to teach the book of Revelation, or change its meaning, or censor it, that you're depriving God's people, you're depriving other people of the opportunity of being saved. You're, you're, you're preventing them from the opportunity of being saved, the opportunity of getting into heaven, the opportunity of being born again. Because in your teaching, you have taken the truth of God's word and you have minimized it in their minds. You've taken the truth of God's word and you have altered it into kind of like a parable, a, a mythology, a fairy tale. You know, kind of like on the level of Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. So, you're going to be responsible before God as a minister of God, as somebody who God, who's God, who God is using to teach others about the Word of God. You're going to be held accountable for what people do with your teaching, and and if your teaching instills in them an unbelief regarding heaven and hell, and if your teaching instills in them serious doubts and questions about whether or not the events in the book of Revelation and Bible uh, prophecy are going to come true as it is written in the Word of God, and and as it is written literally and interpreted through its uh, plain meaning. So, the bottom line is that, that the way we're saved the way we receive any of the promises of God, it's, it says in the Bible that, that our experience in this world, in this passing world as Christians, is from faith to faith, which simply means we, we are saved by faith. We're forgiven by faith when we pray to God and we, we ask him to answer our prayer. It's based on faith in his promises. So it's from faith to faith. And the same holds true regarding eternal life. You, you, you enter into heaven by faith. And by faith, uh, you believe in and you teach. If you really believe that the Bible is God's word, then you're going to faithfully teach the book of Revelation, which is the only book in the Bible, which deals with the, with, with the subjects uh, in, 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 it's like a summary plus more of, of the, the most important subjects affecting our lives together right now in, in what uh, would be called the last days. So uh, the most important thing that you and I can do while we're here on earth, all right, is, is to, be, to recognize that we're here on earth, because God has a plan and purpose for us being here on earth. We're, we're here in the middle of the time of the coronavirus and social upheaval and the great reset or the great reboot, which is really uh, the great reboot or the great reset is really a stealth means of hiding uh, uh, the fact that the, the wealthiest people in the world, the globalist elite, have have spent vast amounts of money that they print from nothing, uh, like a bunch of drunken sailors. But because they secretly rule the world, they, they don't want to pay they don't want they don't want to pay the penalty. They don't want to have to pay for their mishandling of money. Plus they can print money whenever they want it. So their scheme, part of part of what this means when when they created the scientific or dictatorship or the, the technocratic dictatorship, which means the using of science, technology, the science of mind control to control the masses as their slaves. They also, when they made mankind their slaves, okay, they also took away uh, the majority of wealth, ownership, assets and possessions that that were allowed for them to have by almighty god let's remember that our founding fathers 
were able to put together our unique Constitution and Bill of Rights and freedoms based on the teachings of the entire Bible, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, taught by the Pilgrims and Puritans in the 1600s. And, and then the Pilgrims and Puritans had the finest schools in America, which caused all of our founding fathers, whether or not they were, quote, born again Christians, they were at least at the minimum very much exposed to the teachings of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation because they attended pilgrims, uh, pilgrim and Puritan schools. So when they put together the Declaration and the Bill of Independence, when it says stuff like in the Declaration of Independence that the Creator, capital C, has given us certain inalienable rights, such as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, what that means is that our American society, and by the way, you are being lied to, our children are being lied to, and have been lied to for over 125 years or more. Consistently lied to, repetitively lied to. We are told over and over again through the media, through education, that America was never a Christian nation. That is a complete lie and can be refuted by, by an enormous number of historical documents, uh, historical letters, speech, speeches with witnesses, the body of legal evidence and historical evidence is absolutely overwhelming. There's no way that you could be uh, have any integrity at all intellectually and not acknowledge that an historical reality, which is thoroughly documented, is the fact that America is, was founded as a Christian nation and based and built upon the Bible. You have all these, you know, Johnny-come-latelys who make up a bunch of stuff, and it's a lie. See, the truth, Jesus says, will set you free. If Christians go around and others go around believing the lie that America was created as a secular nation, that America was not a Christian nation, then what that does is it softens up the brains of Christians to roll over and accept their freedoms being stolen from them, their freedom of religion, their freedom of press, their freedom of speech. It, it, it softens up the Christians by, by embedding them with that lie. Then they allow the schools to become atheistic and, and rob the Word of God from the hearts of the children. You, you have massive fallout. If you, if you teach this preliminary falsehood that America is not a Christian nation, that's outrageously a lie. And in my books that I recommend you get the book bundles at paulmcguire.us, you will see over and over again quotes, historical quotes, documented quotes, that, that absolutely refute and disprove this silly, evil notion that America was not a Christian nation. That is a total lie. Now, having said that, the whole reason that America has prospered among any other nation on planet Earth, despite all its imperfections, despite its imperfections, is because God has, and still has, at this moment, a unique prophetic plan for America. And that prophetic plan for America is connected to a last day's soul harvest, the igniting of a biblical revival in the nations, a preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ to all the nations, and making disciples of all nations. Making disciples of all nations is what I've been doing uh, on this program for years. That's what I did on today's program. Uh, you, the listener, you're partnering with me in making disciples of all nations. We're integrating biblical truth into everyday reality. The social structure, the political structure, the governmental structure has to be integrated with the truth of the Word of God. Because that's allowing the salt and light of God's Word to heal our culture. And so then the laws of our land produce freedoms, and, and promote the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is essential. Where we are right now 
is that we're in a multi-dimensional warfare for the hearts and minds of mankind. I, I said it in the title of my book, which is called, my newest book is called The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World, where I talk about this and more, and the purpose of America, where we are in the prophetic timeline. And I expose many secrets about, for example, communism, socialism, and Marxism that 99% of, of people don't know. And that 99% of Christians don't know. And because Christians, the Bible says, my people perish for lack of vision vision or knowledge. If you want to, to be, if you want to, to commit mass suicide a, as a people, if Christians, for some strange reason, swallowed the demonic lies and chose to collectively commit mass suicide, self-annihilation. The only way that could happen is when you allow your mind to, to open its doors to lies. Lies always come from the devil. Satan is the father of lies, the author of confusion. Satan has been and is a liar from the beginning. Everything Satan teaches and communicates is often brilliant, creative, and imaginative, and compelling, but it is simply poison laced with a chocolate or something. We have to remember that everything Satan teaches is based on a lie. What God teaches is based on truth. And it's the truth that sets us free. So right now in America, the truth is we have, we have witnessed a social war in, in cities all across America. This was not merely people protesting uh, regarding civil rights. That is not to say that a significant percentage of people who showed up uh, to demonstrate the, the reason they showed up to demonstrate was they had an authentic and sincere desire to protest racism and uh, to promote uh, uh, racial equality, et cetera, et cetera, and to take a stand against the racism. There is racism in our nation. How, to, to the degree, that's, that's a different subject. But, but then you have Antifa. Antifa is a militant Marxist, uh, communist, socialist group. And most of the people in Antifa underneath their masks are, are spoiled, affluent, wealthy, white, uh, uh, young white guys and, and white women. Okay, But Antifa is funded by super billionaires who, who want to... Uh, have a regime change in America and radically transform America into a communist, Marxist, socialist nation. These men are super capitalists. Why would they want to transform America into a communist nation? Because it is, and this is why knowledge is power. If you don't have this knowledge, man, you're just a sucker. You're just a sucker. You're, you're an easy mark. You're a target. The reason it's the super capitalists the super globalist elite and the super wealthy that are secretly financing all of the mainstream media to destroy America as we know it, to, 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 to uh, shatter any positive perception of President Trump. He was under systematic psychological warfare, paid for by billionaires 24-7. Every news story, every second, was both, most of the time, not true, a complete lie, and designed to destroy and undermine who they perceived as their number one enemy. Knowledge is power. Let us not forget that it is the globalist elite, this is the wealthiest people in the world, it's they who publicly determined and identified President Donald Trump as the greatest threat to their new world order. Well, I want to say this again. You have Christians who don't even know what the new world order is. What fools they are. 
It is the heads of the New World Order. It's the wealthiest people on planet Earth. It's the globalist elite. It's the shadow government who publicly said that Donald Trump, President Donald Trump, is the single most greatest threat to their ability to bring in the world order. Now you can see plainly why they have done everything to destroy him and his family, from uh, phony collusion a- uh, accusations to uh, phony Russian things to it just never ended. And, and now uh, we're in the middle of a dispute over who really won the election. And, you know, my, the purpose of this program is not to take political sides. The purpose of this program is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But when you see something that is apparently wrong, uh, or allegedly wrong, you have a responsibility to speak out on it. So, allegedly, and, and, and the allegations are based on some very substantive facts, well, first of all, you have the Dominion voting machines. And, you, and we, have, we have an election where, where people are, are saying, who really won the election? And there's some key states that the, the outcome of the election is based on. Yet, when legal authorities and legal teams have examined these battleground states, in addition, uh, many of these states used uh, vote, electronic voting machines called Dominion. Now, I remember doing research on the electronic voting machines 10 years ago, no, in my, my, in my book, the Prophecy of the Future of America, Volume 1, and then there's the Prophecy of the Future of America, Volume 2. In, in those books, and in my book, Mass Awakening, uh, and going back at least eight years or more, I was aware of the fact that voting machines were were considered the most effective way of rigging an election, stealing an election, and and changing and falsifying an accurate vote count. So it was knowledge to me and anybody who bothered to do homework, you know, seven or eight years ago. And this had nothing to do with any one political party because at the time I read the research. Uh, uh, a Democrat was in office, and the Democrat was concerned about uh, vote voting machines that are rigged. So, these voting machines, these Dominion voting machines, on a technological level, have multiple ways that that a normal person with very little training can access these Dominion voting machines and rig and artificially manipulate the vote count to favor any candidate that they want to. So in other words, the Dominion voting machines are built with the capacity to easily uh, transfer votes from one candidate to another. Uh, The Dominion voting machines have multiple ways and easy to access ways that allow to use with very little training, a person operating the Dominion voting machine can, can lie electronically uh, about the vote. And they can make uh, uh, any particular candidate, Democrat, Republican, or whatever, they can artificially magnify any candidate's vote by thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of votes. And if you do this all over the place, now you are very simply using the Dominion voting machine. Uh, you can use it to change hundreds and hundreds of thousands of votes, or potentially more, wherever it's used. Now, I was reading this seven years ago, and then I'm going back seven years. It turns out, as I'm reading it, that a number of very powerful, super wealthy men, Uh, one that you would know, a household name, 
uh, of, of one of the wealthiest men in the world, was on the board of the Dominion Voting Machine Company and was uh, one of the highest level directors uh, running the Dominion Voting Machine Company. So this super billionaire who's known for for spending hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of his own money to finance radical leftist causes. He's probably the biggest publicly known super billionaire who who funds on a regular basis radical leftist causes. And he also um, is one of the owners and top people and, and biggest stockholders of this Dominion voting machine, which is the, the biggest electronic voting machine that was used in this recent election. But when I was doing research on this seven years ago, and the only reason I'm not mentioning this guy's name is, is uh, for matters that, that can be discussed on another day. But you know who this guy is. Okay, he is probably one of the most famous super billionaires known for for funding radical causes on planet Earth. And so, why would this super billionaire who finances radical liberal causes just happen to be the guy owning and controlling uh, the, the the biggest weapon in in rigging votes, which is the electronic? voting machine, specifically the Dominion voting machine. So back when I read this article seven years ago, because I used it for research in my book, The Day the Dollar Died, and others, which you can get at a bundle, a book bundle discount by going to paulmcguire.us. Seven years ago, I learned that voting machines made are the easiest way to rig an election, and that nations all over the world have discovered that the best way to 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 allow a, an election to be falsified or rigged is via electronic voting machines. In fact, this is such common knowledge that there are many states in the United States that legally uh, have made it illegal for their state to use electronic voting machines and specifically uh, uh, the Dominion voting machine. Nations all over the world have forbid and outlawed the usage of the Dominion uh, voting machine, electronic voting machine, and nations all over the world have outlawed and made Ill- made it illegal to use electronic voting machines uh, of any kind. So, so people with knowledge and experts, the people that really know the way the world works, all understand that the easiest way to rig an election and guarantee that your candidate wins, whether or not it's legal or not legal, the easiest way to accomplish that evil goal is by using an electronic voting machine. So everybody who's part of the elite knows this. And even if you're not part of the elite, people with knowledge have power. They all knew this. I knew this. People who know what they're talking about like you, you've probably heard this. So why would all these states, a huge number of states, deliberately allow the usage of electronic voting machines, election after election, and then in, in what everybody knew would be the, the, the most hotly contested election in, in U.S. history, which we've just, we're not finished with yet, why would that's, why would anybody in that state why would any governmental official use the Dominion voting machine? It was common knowledge that these voting machines, not just under the name Dominion, but other voting machines, including the Dominion voting machine, were owned and controlled by this super radical liberal billionaire. There's only one reason you would do that, and that is you had the intention of rigging the election. Did you ever ask yourself the question when you watch this election? You have one candidate and and the top people around him. This one candidate, the liberal candidate, 
uh, the, the vice president candidate. And they're all like, you know, laid back. They're all relaxed. It's not just because this can- uh, candidate uh, clearly was receiving medication, allegedly was receiving medication, and uh, 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 was suffering from allegedly cog- se- severe cognitive or brain impairment. That wasn't just the only reason why he was like laid back and nobody seemed to have any pressure on them. And did you ask yourself the question why everybody was so, so laid back about the election on the radical liberal side? They didn't seem to be worried about the election. Didn't I know, because you listen to this program and because you're an independent thinker, that you thought the same thing. You ask yourself, why are they so calm? Why are they so laid back? They're, they're not making speeches anywhere, okay, except maybe to the, the, the checkout uh, cashier of uh, a drive through uh, McDonald's, right? They're, they're not, they're not, Trump is, is like, you know, I, I, I forgot how old he is, but he's not a spring chicken. Trump is jumping on plane after plane, speaking to these massive rallies. Four major rallies a day, three at the very least, sometimes five major rallies. I mean, I speak at a lot of conferences. I used to jump on planes, okay? I'd be speaking in Dallas, and then three hours later, and live on television in Dallas, and three hours later, I would have flown to uh, uh, North Dakota uh, and, and, and speak. And that wiped me out. And you're, I'm just, that's just two conferences. And that wiped me out. I, so I don't have to understand how Trump did that. So he is killing himself in terms of the energy. Plus, he just recovered from the coronavirus. He is giving it everything he can. All right? It, it is exhausting to speak. And yet, Trump spoke constantly. And these big mega rallies, they're, they're, they're you know, it may not look like it, but it's, it's emotionally exhausting. It's physically exhausting. So Trump is pouring it on, all right, with everything he has. And the other side is like kicking back. And people like myself and you are asking the question, why, why are they like so relaxed about it? They're acting as if they know they won before they won. Because they're being so laid back and not really campaigning, they're acting and behaving as if they knew the answer, which was they knew that they had won the election. So, so there was, there was you know, because they knew in advance that they had won the election, they were kicking back. They were taking it easy because it was a done deal. Now, how did they know that they had won the election? Was it because all the polls said that Trump overwhelmingly, excuse me, was it because the polls said that their candidate won overwhelmingly in in all the key states? Was it because the polls say, the the polls said that Trump was going to lose in advance? No, no. The polls were disputed because the the, the media, the mainstream media does not know how to tap into, to, uh, the, the, the massive numbers of people that voted for Donald Trump. So the 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 the, uh, the leftist side had no reason for being so confident. They didn't have any data in, in, in the sense of polls. They didn't have any data saying that there's going to be a massive turnout for their candidate. Okay. What they what what allegedly they may have known, or at least some people in their system high up, allegedly what they may have known, and this is was alleged by uh, Mayor Giuliani uh, just recently. What he said was that they had a plan, and they had rigged, and they knew they were going to rig. Uh, uh, the polling places, they were going to rig the election, uh, Giuliani said, in Biden's favor, 
by using the Dominion voting machines, by not allowing uh, the the inspectors who were uh, uh, Republicans uh, to inspect at a close distance uh, the actual counting of ballot ballots. Uh, they they knew that ballots were being falsified, that names were being written in. In other words, according to Giuliani and and a number of powerful lawyers and experts that surrounded uh, him at a, pref- at a at a recent press conference, according to Giuliani, they have just discovered and finalized what Giuliani said were very, very serious allegations, and Giuliani said he believed that they were beyond allegations. He, Giuliani said he, he believed that criminal activities occurred, which enabled uh, uh, the radical left to steal the election from Donald Trump. Now, if that's true, that's treason. That's, that's you're watching a revolution, okay? So, but this was known, the danger of electronic voting machines was known seven years ago. I was writing about it. I was researching it. And this one individual back then, seven years ago, had bought a number of electronic voting machine companies. And it's the same individual, Giuliani named him by name, the super billionaire, radical liberal, who was the, the, the primary owner of the Dominion Voting Machine Company, and all the experts seven years ago, uh, uh, and up until today, all the experts will tell you the easiest way to rig an election is by using electronic voting machines, because electronic voting machines have numerous ways uh, by which you can uh, change uh, and, and shift the vote count. And then you have all the other methods of cheating. All the, 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 the states where the ballots were being counted, and then you couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure it out. It would start out at the beginning of the count, like Trump would be 100,000 votes ahead. And then, you know, like at 12.49 a.m. in the morning, they would, I don't know what they do, they would recount or they would shut the polling facility down and nobody was allowed to go in, nobody was allowed to look. So for about an hour, two hours, or three hours, or whatever it was, they sealed off the area. They, they, they got everybody out of there, polling places of where they count the votes. They, they pushed everybody out of there. They shut down all the windows and walls, and then they operated in secret for hours. Then mysteriously, even though the election in all these individual places Trump is way ahead uh, at the beginning of the election, and when they shut down the, 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 the counting area and chase everybody out, mysteriously, in location after location, out of the middle of nowhere, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Biden voters materialize, and nobody can figure out where they came from, because in many of these places, the total amount of votes that came in exceeded 100% of, of the potential voters in that area. In some cases, there were many states where the, the amount of votes that came in were 200% more or 200% higher than, than all the possible votes of people who, who could possibly vote in that area. So, so if we look at it this way, take any given area, Pennsylvania, Arizona, whatever area you want to talk about, you take any area, and if all the, if all the legal potential voters of any uh, voting area, if all the potential legal voters actually vote, in that area, that their total can only reach a certain number. Because if you were to count all the people who were registered in that district, 
who lived in that district, if you were to do a count mathematically and with computers, you would arrive at some numerical number which which represents the maximum amount of voters that that could have possibly voted in in, in, in any given election area. So let's just say hypothetically you're talking about uh, an area in Pennsylvania where where if you counted every potential voter, if you counted every potential voter from both parties, let's just say hypothetically, for the sake of argument, the maximum, if 100% of the people voted in, any given, in an area in Pennsylvania, hypothetically, then, five, then that would represent, uh, let's say, 500,000 people. Okay? Now, you couldn't go above 500,000 people because, because you don't have any more people to vote. You, you've counted, you've already counted every potential voter and you've hypothetically counted them as voting. So, so just based on how many homes, how many apartments, how many condos, how many people are registered, there, there's, there's a, a ceiling to it. It can't go any higher. So let's say it's 500,000 people. So if 500,000 people is the, is the maximum, you can't go to 600,000 or 700,000 or a million people. Why? Because they don't exist. You've already accounted every possible human being who can vote, and you've counted them as voting. So all across America right now, you have these uh, election districts where the total amount of people that voted for, for either candidate, for either party, the total amount of people vote, voted, who voted, is exceeding 100%. I mean, this is in a huge number of, of, of critical districts across the United States. You have a total amount of voters that has already reached, and in many cases, has substantially exceeded the, the total amount of voters possible. So if, if you've got people voting in critical areas all across the United States that have already reached 100% of the, of the total voters of that area and are now 150, 200, 300, 400%, 500%, 700% more than the total maximum amount, which is 100%, where did you pick up all these you know, if the, if the total uh, maximum amount is 100%, where did you get all the people to vote that enable you to achieve 600%? It's impossible, because you obviously are not counting real people in, in your area. And, and if you count people that live somewhere else in a register, that all can be rectified. These Whenever you see an area where the total amount of people that are voting exceeds 100%, that is glaring evidence of somebody manipulating and rigging the numbers. Because what you're doing is you're creating artificial and fake voters. The only way you can exceed 100% of the voters in any given area, the only way you can do that is to artificially create, artificially manufacture the, the, the number of voters by rigging the voting machines, rigging the counts, uh, counting people multiple times, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You, you have rigged it. You've manipulated it. So, this is what's happening in our nation right now. So, why is this important? Because Who is elected represents ideas. Ideas have consequences. All of our religious freedoms, the right to preach the gospel, the right to read the word of God, the right to go to church, the the, the right to pray, the, the right to be a Christian and not be persecuted. That's one of your primary rights as a U.S. citizen, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, which means no group of special interests like the globalist elite can control all of the mainstream media. So we're supposed to have freedom of the press, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, which means you're allowed to say what you believe without fear of being 
killed, shot, threatened, or fired. So if you believe that, that you know, uh, Jesus is Lord, you have the right to believe that. You can't be fired from your job for believing that. So all of the freedoms we have, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that's a big deal. All of the constitutional freedoms and rights that we have that are based on the Bible can now, depending upon how this election challenge is resolved, all of your freedom, all of your religious freedoms, all of your constitutional freedoms are up for grabs depending upon who wins this election. Which means if people, when the day is done, um, if people become the president, the vice president, uh, senators, congressmen, uh, people who ran for political office all across the United States, when the day is done, in any area or as a nation as a whole, if you or the American public have voted people into office that do not respect and will not uphold the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, but they will violate it, then you have created a state of emergency for every Bible-believing Christian in America. You have cre- if, if, if people who are the enemies of the gospel of Jesus Christ, whether they realize it or not, if there are people come into power that, that end up being enemies of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then, as enemies of the gospel of Jesus Christ, they choose to wage war on Christianity with the intent of destroying it. No more church meetings, no more preaching the gospel, no more word of God, no more worship. In other words, they are at war with the Bible. No more allowing uh, students to to be exposed to the Bible or the Ten Commandments in, in the school system or in the media. And on and on it goes. And on and on it goes. What will happen, that's a war against the truth. That's It may be carried out by politicians, but... What we're looking at, and we have to come to grips with it, and we need to leave fantasy land in order to come to grips with it. There's a lot of people in the Christian church today, their mentality regarding the the lordship of Christ is they kind of see Jesus Christ as either Santa Claus, or they they see Jesus Christ as like Willy Wonka in uh, the the novel Willy Wonka in, in the Chocolate Factory. He's just some fantasy character to, to, to you know, give you ends, an endless amount of chocolate. That's not it. We, God has blessed this nation, so we've been protected. None of us, most of us have never lived in a brutal communist nation or a totalitarian nation where you're killed and viciously persecuted for your faith. If we don't do everything we can spiritually, Legally, but physically and practically, if we don't do everything we can in all those different dimensions to stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ, to defend the gospel of Jesus Christ, and to win souls uh, uh, to Jesus Christ, then if our religious freedoms are taken away, and the way that would happen is through uh, judges, Passing new laws, regulations, zoning. There's countless uh, bureaucratic ways of destroying true Christianity in our nation. And that's what the globalist elite want, ultimately. Because true Christianity and the Bible uh, is, is an obstacle to the global plans of global slavery for all of mankind that is planned by by just a handful of globalist elite who are secretly servants of Satan and Lucifer. And we're coming to to the, the time zone where the globalist elite 
are they want they they want to make us their slaves primarily through scientific mind control but they want to seal the deal and so it is their game plan the globalist elite it is their game plan to to force every man and woman alive including everybody in America every child every child just born it is their game plan to embed a microchip or a nanochip or a DNA chip implant inside the body of every adult and child living in America and every other nation. Why? Because just like a wealthy horse owner or cattle owner owns, you know, a lot of cattle or a lot of horse, a lot of horses, not only do they brand those animals, but they put a microchip implant in those animals so those horses and cattle cannot be stolen because that is the property of the elite that own them. So what they want to do on a planetary level is they want to to implement total mass surveillance, total lockdown, and total control, and totally and perfectly enslave every man and woman uh, alive on planet Earth, and, and how this culminates, how the scientific dictatorship culminates, it culminates in Bible prophecy, which you wouldn't know about unless you read Revelation 13. You read the account of how a, a, a world charismatic leader, head of a one-world government, um, demands that the world worship him as God. He is the Antichrist. He will set himself up uh, and sit on a throne in the rebuilt temple of Jerusalem, and he will demand that the world worship him as God. He is the Antichrist. And he is put into power by the false prophet who's head of the one world religious system and the one world economic system. So, so you wouldn't understand uh, how these things all uh, function as a synergy and come together, but it's coming together in our lifetime. So all they need is a pretense or an excuse, such as national security, such as the, the, the dispensing of a virus which secretly contains a nano chip or a DNA chip implant, any number of purposes, and um, they will force uh, uh, populations in America and around the world for for their own safety. So it could be the the threat of the coronavirus or or other bacteriological warfare uh, uh, weapons. So due to the threat of the coronavirus and, and social trackers, etc., it would be law that every single person in the U.S. or wherever would be forced to receive uh, an implant uh, uh, under their skin of a microchip, nanochip, DNA chip, biochip implant, which plugs them in to technologically via artificial intelligence and wireless 5G communications, it plugs every person who receives the mark of the beast, it plugs them into the hive mind of the world brain, which is which is uh, run by artificial intelligence. And then, in order for a person to receive this mark of the beast, 666, or this chip implant, They have to publicly renounce Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and then they have to publicly proclaim that they are going to worship the Antichrist as God. Once a person does that, renounces Jesus, and begins to worship the Antichrist as God, then they can put the biochip implant in them. They're plugged into the hive mind in the world brain. Then and only then can they buy and sell uh, in the world system, but they will also be subject to mass surveillance 24-7. Their minds will be already 
whether whether people want to believe it or not, and I write about it in my books, like Conquering the Matrix, already we have computer-to-brain interface technologies which enable the satellites and artificial intelligence. It allow there's technology available now which allows uh, an elite to literally read the the minds, the thoughts, the emotions, and the memories of any person. You can scan electronically and know what they're thinking via the microchip implant, as well as controlling behavior, etc. So ultimately, the microchip implant becomes the ultimate tool of an all-powerful technological slavery that will enslave every man and woman and child on planet Earth. Remember, the goal of the occult satanic elite, or the technological elite, or the technocratic elite, their goal is to dominate, isn't it interesting that the, that, that the uh, voting machines are called dominion, their goal is to dominate uh, the human race and to turn the human race into slaves, because this is the goal of Lucifer. They're, they're following Lucifer. The way that you turn every man or woman into your slave is when you embed them electronically with a, a chip implant, a DNA implant, or whatever. You have now total control of their biological system, their psychological system, their physical body system, their mind, their memories, their thoughts. You can control what they buy or sell. You can terminate their life, and you can track them from a satellite. And you say, well, that's, that sounds far-fetched. Hey, 15 years ago, if you had a cell phone, whether you knew it or not, that cell phone had, had GPS embedded into it. Wherever you went, could could be tracked by satellite and viewed by by people anywhere in the world. So mass surveillance is important. But what we have to ultimately understand is that all of this is, at its essence, a satanic slave system run by Lucifer, Satan, the father of lies. And the Bible predicts all of it. This is Mystery Babylon, or Babylon the Great, re-emerging. In our lifetime, the great harlot that's talked about in the book of Revelation, the rise of the great harlot, which is the satanic world system known as Mystery Babylon, this cashless society, the biochip implants, are all representations of the return of Mystery Babylon and the one world government, the one world religion, and the one world economic system and the rise of the Antichrist, and mankind and Satan's final rebellion against God, which will culminate at Armageddon, uh, fought in the Valley of Megiddo. So we are in the time period right before Jesus Christ returns at the Second Coming, where he will defeat Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and all those nations that are following the Antichrist. What Jesus has called us to do is not freak out and be terrified, but Jesus has called us to, one, preach the gospel, two, occupy until he comes at the second coming, number three, uh, make disciples of all nations. God did not create us to freak out, become hysterical, and, 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 and run around in a state of shock. God has created us for this time because he wants us to preach the gospel to all nations. And God will supernaturally empower you so that you will be able to be an overcomer, to to be a joint heir with Jesus on a level that you never thought possible. And if you will simply adopt in your mind the mindset of faith in, in the integrity of God's word, you will be more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. God bless you. This is Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. We need your prayers as a prayer warrior for me, my family, and this ministry as never before as we press back the front lines and take territory for the Lord Jesus Christ. We need you, and I thank you 
for spreading our messages far and wide so we're not blocked by big tech censorship. And finally, I'm asking you to go before the Lord Jesus Christ and ask Jesus, what does he want you to do in terms of giving, making donations, or making a financial contribution so that we can accomplish the preaching of the gospel? And then whatever the Lord tells you to do, whatever he he requires you to give or donate and contribute, simply obey the Lord and God will bless you for it. God bless you. This is Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us.